So Paul Revel, thank you so much for taking some time with us today. Paul is a professor of education at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. He's the founding partner, or I'm sorry, founding director of his education redesign lab. He spent just under five years as a secretary of education for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, which I would say arguably has one of the best education systems in the nation. He serves on multiple boards. He's been a principal, he's been um, a teacher, of course, and I'm so happy that you are able to impart some of your wisdom with me today. Well, thank you, Drew, for inviting me, and uh, I'm delighted to be with you. I'm a fan of your work, and um, it's an honor to have an opportunity to join you. Oh, I really appreciate that. Thank you. I'd like to quote something, and, and I applaud your being such an advocate and writing in the Boston Globe, for example, um, the Harvard Gazette you were interviewed by, but I'd like to quote, you said, successful systems have a cradle to career pipeline insulated by systems of opportunity and support, but this is a civic responsibility for the entire community. So I'd like to know for parents and educators alike, how can we participate in this, in this civic responsibility? Well, you know, uh, the Chinese character um, for a crisis presents danger and opportunity at the same time. And, uh, you know, it's, we obviously are familiar with the dangers associated with this crisis. The opportunity, I think, is for education advocates, for education leaders, for parents and communities to use this crisis as an opportunity to pivot and demand more in the way of a strengthened social contract between our communities and our families. If we are in fact to achieve our national goals of educating all children, so all children have a shot at becoming middle class by middle age, you know, if we're gonna make everybody college and career ready, we're gonna to have to do more than simply provide public schools as we have historically known them that consume 20% of a child's waking hours between kindergarten and grade 12. And in order to do this, we can't just turn to the schools and say, you've got to attend to all these external needs. You've got to attend to the 80% of time that children are awake but not in school and need enrichment. You've got to attend to mental health needs or food and nutrition needs or medical needs. That's not realistic. That's something that communities need to do together. So I think what parents more than anything can do is exercise demand on local public officials to um, respond to the needs that have been so vividly revealed in this crisis and to uh, include that in our sense of what our civic responsibility is, what our social contract is, what families can expect from their community by way of support, and in turn, what communities can expect of families by way of nurturing their young people and, and responsibly giving them every opportunity to learn at home and become the citizens and workers that we want them to be in the future. Based on your work with the Education Redesign Lab at Harvard, how are you kind of hitting the reset button now in, in light of recent events? Well, the um, current events have kind of revealed the disturbing inequities that we've been working on for ever since our foundation. I mean, our, our basic premise is the inequities in the lives of children outside of school have as much to do with variance in school performance as anything that happens in school. And attending to these inequities, you know, basics, Maslowian hierarchy needs like food, clothing, shelter, access to internet, all these things. A lot of people made the glib assumption that schools were taking care of all that. But those of us who work in schools and, and uh, live and work with families who are part of the school system realize that school systems never really had the capacity to do all those things. We're working with a lot of our communities now on how do we make the most of summer? I've argued for a long time that summer ought to be a third semester or a fifth quarter. It ought to be an entitlement for all children to have enriched summer learning opportunities, not just be an accident of birth. You're born into a family that happens to be able to support summer camp or summer learning of various kinds, and you get it. And if you're not in such a family, you don't. Now, everybody needs it this summer, and that's broadly recognized because schools have been closed for so long. So we have an opportunity this summer and next summer, I think, to, to make summer learning an entitlement in many of our communities. 
That's so interesting. Can I ask then about the, the flip side of that then with our teachers? How do you envision or how are teachers now being professionally trained to be able to accommodate this remote or distance learning? Well, I think that's one of the big challenges because this all happened virtually overnight. I mean, it happened to me. I teach in the university context overnight and it happened uh, to teachers in public schools overnight. And they don't have the <clears throat> wherewithal, for example, that Harvard University can give me to help make the transition. They don't have big IT departments and, and professional development functions that aid with teaching. So, and now they're not there, they're not on site. So this has to be done at a distance. And at the same time, many of them are asked to be responsive to their students six to eight hours a day. And they're having to deal with their own children at home and to lay professional development on top of this uh, is, is proving challenging and, and raising some, some tense discussions over union contracts and things of that nature. But we're gonna have to use some of these same online tools, platforms and instruments to provide teachers the professional development they need to use this uh, new equipment and, and connectivity in ways that are productive. Not least of which is how to connect better with parents. You know, this is another silver lining for this crisis. For a long time, you know, educators uh, have given lip service to uh, engaging with parents as children's primary and, and, and first educators. Um, but many schools have ignored this um, connection and uh, taking advantage of the asset of parents and families. Now, suddenly families, you know, are the lead educators day to day. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and many families need... Uh, communication about what's expected, support and how to do it. And teachers need to find ways to reach out and work constructively with families. And like our children, families are all different in terms of what their circumstances are, what their assets are, what their needs are. <clears throat> and so what we're seeing, I think, Taru, is sort of the breakdown of the one size fits all model. It just, it didn't work for students in schools because students are all very different human beings as those of us who have multiple children know. And, um, and the, a system that was designed on the average or designed for one size, a sort of factory model, isn't gonna work any better with parents than it is with students. So we've gotta figure out a way to use these tools to strengthen teachers' capacity to in turn use them in connection with students and families, or it's a, it's a wasted opportunity. So thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me, Paul. Well, thank you, uh, Taru, for giving me the opportunity. And again, I, I see a great opportunity here, and I think parents can play a huge role uh, in, in turning the educational ship of state in a positive direction by exercising demand on their public officials. So I hope people get out and do that. Thank okay. you very much for having me. Thank you so much, Paul.